Welcome to episode 74 of The Neuro Show. In today's episode, Taipei Bike Show is on with all its latest and greatest, but why aren't we that excited? Chris is on the ground at Peaks Challenge, sniffing around bikes, and is outside help at a Fondo okay? Finally, a look around some of the bling recovery techniques out there. All right, let's get into it. So it's exactly a year to the week since we sat down at this desk and we carried on like little kids because a few videos popped up from this wildly extreme bike expo in some country called Taiwan. Mm. And we were just (laughs) beside ourselves. We were watching bicycle technology from Mars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 12 months on, Jesse, the China, the, sorry, (laughs) the the, the, the Taiwan bike show is back. And Jesse Coyle, where are you at with it? I... I didn't watch any of the Taipei Bike Show videos. Now, they came up on my feed. We had China Cycling was there. Dave Arthur was there. Delaney was there. The crew were all there. Well, they did, yeah. There was a full junket tour across from the, from the TCR factory. <laughs> They're all off. They're probably doing chain gang across to the, to the expo. But well, Dave wasn't. He was hot uh, and sweaty and humid. But yes. So they're all carried through. I, I just, there was nothing in them. That really got me to click, to be honest. So I haven't watched them. You've watched them. So we are going to go through it anyway. But just as a reflection of my current standing on the whole uh, direct from Asia, emerging brands kind of thing, I, I've really cooled on it overall, which is why I never watched it. I didn't watch any of these. Yeah. Which I is think- not particularly good for the chat we're going to have because I haven't watched them. But you'll have to help me fill in the blanks of what's, uh, what's happening. Not necessarily because I think that's the that's – the- that's ultimately where I thought the chat would go, that why are we a little bit disillusioned with it? I'm a little bit like yourself. I saw it come up and it took me a few days to muster up the excitement to go, oh, all right, Joe, I'll, I'll jump in and I'll watch some of these. And, yeah, it was pretty much like what you thought. They were lots and lots of wheel brands. Um, look, I'll go through some of the things that popped out to me. Just the wheel brand stuff at this point is a meme. Like it, 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 <laughs> as every Taiwanese citizen, is it by rule you now have to have a wheel company? I don't understand. There are so many of them. Uh, they're all now trying to they're trying to find points of difference. The lightness of it obviously is one of them. But now you're going into these boutique, bizarre carbon spoke patterns like those bike head things. So mm-hmm. you've got, you know, like strange lattice networks of, of wheels on bikes to try and cut through. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'll get, we'll talk about some of that, some of that stuff on the ground a bit later, but just from a pure viewer perspective, it didn't really move the needle much for me. Um, it's, I mean, the only thing with the wheels, the wheels just don't excite me because there's so many brands now. Mm. I, I, I'm, I'm don't really interested to see the 28th carbon wheel brand. So, but that's not a bad thing. No. I mean, that's awesome. But the only interesting I thought was when you saw these wheels um, come out with it, all the carbon spokes, carbon hubs, like looking more advanced than the, the Western brands' wheels. Like K, uh, Giant, as part of the TCR release, released the, the KDX 40s. And it's, you know, they, they were quite hot over it. I think it's really, I'm like, that looks like, you know, every second brand at the Taipei Bike Show, doesn't yeah, it? I yeah. mean, so uh, the wheels have. As much as I'm not that interested, it's pretty cool how advanced those, well, the Taiwanese or the Chinese brands are getting those wheels. It's, it's even surpassing the, the Western brands, it seems like. Wheel Lab, uh, I, 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 that's the other thing. I, being a bit dyslexic, like you look at the, the wheel logos and, of course, they're like front ways and back ways and upside down and they've just, I can't work most of them out. What have you read? It's AVV. IAV was one of them. Apex was another one. Um, Did you see big cock frames? Be, uh, yeah. <laughs> they're up. They're, they're live. Up. Actually, they're live. live on Panda yep. Podium they're now. They're live. Get one. <laughs> um, still, I'm still waiting for an ad read for them. We've got to get got to get those boys online. <laughs> um, yeah, Rider spelt R I D E A. Uh, Black. It's just yeah. It just sort of deteriorates. In look, L2. We're talking L2 again. I know this is sort of. Something uh, Joe's done an unboxing on. I'll link that down below. The frustrating thing with this is it's 
allegedly a new product, but the, it just it's the same model number. It's everything the same. You only the only way to know is there's like a different sheen on the logo in there. But there are advancements to it, like instead of a two piece brake caliper, it's a one piece brake caliper. So ultimately, it is a more refined product. But it's a bit of a once bitten, twice shy case exactly. with the L two because you're going okay, like yeah, you've updated it, but. I'm not going to sit here and go, oh, look at this amazing. Did you see the L2? Oh, it's half the price. And you're like, no, no, no. You did that the first time. It did it. It wasn't robust enough. You hadn't done your testing. So that that's why it's it's all, you know, it's all well and good seeing it, but until it's it's out until it's tested and it actually works consistently. And now I feel that the genie's out of the bottle with this that maybe this is just some big long play to get bought by another brand and it'll it all ends up just being it's phase one yeah. of whatever. So it'll be yeah. a giant shift correct group set, you know, in five years possibly. Right, that I'm gonna save that because I reckon you could be onto it. But anyway, um and the other one that is just so hard to get around is the three D printing stuff. Okay. So So what did you see? Well everything that was 3D. So oh, okay, Dave so just, Arthur's just, first five, ten minutes of his video is just 3D printed stuff. So it's he printed handlebars, bottom brackets, lugs, frames, 3D. There was a guy with a 3D printed rear derailleur. <laughs> um, it's, yeah. So what do they sell? Are, they st- are you just selling the, the, uh, the file what? when you print it at home? Or, or, but what's the selling? So what's the, th- the 3D printed thing, aside from it kind of sounding like I, you know when some people just say it's, it's AI? Like, well, I mean, what's it says 3D to me? 3D printed is that bucket. It's a it's a 3D printed shifter lever. Okay, what's the benefit? Do I I don't really care if it's 3D printed or not. So what's is there any theme with the 3D printed products that are coming out now? What's is it that are they lighter? Because well, it's just they're cheaper to custom, make. They're just cheaper, isn't that? I mean, that's what I've always understood. The benefit of 3D printing is that you reduce the actual production costs. Beyond that. But there was when you were watching them, there was nothing that stood out that were just sort of equivalent or competitor products and they just happened to be 3D printed. The, the standout thing was that you looked at a bottom bracket or you looked at a frame and you went, oh, that just looks like a normal frame. And then they, you were told, oh, that was 3D printed. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Again, this, yep. this is, this, I just feel like a lot of this stuff's not at a consumer level. Yeah. It's Maybe this is the whole problem with this stuff in the first place and we're expecting too much from it that ultimately it is a trade show. So it is something where mm. brand people walk around and go, oh, that's an interesting concept. Maybe you can come in and talk to our R&D team and we mm. can work out how to do 3D printing of the front end of the 2027 TCR. I don't know. I mean, mm. that maybe that's what all this stuff exists for and idiots like us sitting miles away <laughs> thinking that this is going to be the next thing to appear on the web for us to buy is not realistic. Yeah, maybe we are asking too much. Possibly. And then now, there's, there's yeah, all yeah. the other trinkets, which is kind of, kind of interesting, like the things like the brake caliper, the different colored brake calipers that will work with SRAM and Shimano so you can sort of trip your bike out there, your disc rotors that will have different decals and things on them. You know, there's all your weight weenie stuff like that. But So did you see anything as well frame-wise? That's where... I would, it would be cool if there was some movement. What are you seeing? Carbon road bike frames. Anything, anything out there? I did see, actually, no, I, I did see one. Uh, China Cycling was back at the, uh, the Trigon yeah. stand. Um, okay. I'm kind of setting you up here and even asking that because I've got an opinion on this, right? So how many times have we seen these frames now? Because I, I swear we saw Trigon a year ago and it looked like a complete bike mm. and i i mean i haven't seen the only time i see trigon is is at a show at the show when, when i'm watching it on youtube and you're kind of looking at the you know then, then there's the sava and there is the bros um all these brands that most people aren't going to recognize because you can't get them anywhere and i'm kind of looking at these things going now it's just it's all one big tease because you're looking at it going oh that's a really nice competitor to the scott foil and then it you can't buy it here and I know that maybe that's a Western arrogance, but I don't, I don't care if it's available domestically in China. It means nothing to me. I'll be able to get them here. And that's where, honestly, I thought Panda Podium would come in. 
that's why I was on the big, the Panda Podium hype because I thought he would be really um, getting in a lot of these brands, especially the the things where there's a hole in the market. The wheels is not really that much of a hole, but the frames, there sort of is. But a lot of these brands, I still like. I still cannot buy a Trigon, a Bros. So I'm finding it hard to get super excited about these really competitive looking carbon frames because over the last few years they don't seem to be getting out of the country well out of out of taiwan or china overseas now you're dead right whether it is just the thing that joe was talking about that it's the chinese domestic market sucking up the the stock of it i don't know but it it did feel like trigon was the next one to cut through like it that was the next win space that was the next elves yeah, because the bike, yeah, they look cool. Like they look, they look ready to go, ready to ship. Let's let's do it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what's going on, especially there. that Trigon one in particular. You're mm. kind of looking at that, going, that I, f- I mean, obviously someone has to ride it and review it, things like that. But the, just on the specs, you're going, that really looks like it could compete with a Propel or or something from a Western brand, and it's not available. I mean, so Joe from from Trina Cycling, he, he's making an effort. So on Panda Podium, they've got. They do have that new big rock, so Sotea frame, so that's a road frame. But I'm, I'm, it's just not, it's not a super modern looking, it's you know, aero tweaked frame. It's just as the climbing frame, so it's not the ones that you're looking at when you're watching these videos. Going, oh, that looks really interesting. It looks like it, it's a, it's a disruptor. This is more of just an elves start looking bike, which is again okay. Nice to have, but the only other thing I'll say, just from the the content that I saw, there seemed to be less of the just pure lightweight for lightweight sake stuff being presented, and that could just simply be due to the fact that w- what we were looking at was the stuff that was cultivated or curated, sorry, by the the guys who were actually producing the videos to give us what they thought would get clicks. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was less of the you know, like carbon through axles and and all the just this is eleven grams type type sort of stuff. More mm-hmm. trinkety ex, trinkety interesting accessories rather than just pure lightweight things. Which I think in general is probably I felt like last year might have been the lightweight for lightweight sake. Yeah. Whereas yeah, I think we might have moved away from that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Am I too negative? Yeah. With, with that. <laughs> It's only because I have really high hopes for it, and like that segment gets me really excited. I, I think there's so much potential there, and then it's just but, I mean, when the years go on and you, it's, it's still you know <laughs> wind space, um, you know, and the craft wheels, you know, and I'm just you're looking at all these brands and just go, oh, like if we could. J- so is it just accessibility? Yeah. Because I, I was sort of thinking at it more from the perspective of am I just being a a snob that. I'm not seeing something that's blowing me away. Like this, we have this conversation with any guest we ever have on. There's only so much you can actually do with this little thing called a bike. At some point you're kind of running out of, yeah, room to move. So is it just the accessibility of it that's bumming us out with, with, this, with this product line? No, no, I think you're right. It's just purely the accessibility. It's not that I'm not – looking at those bikes going, oh, I think they could really be competitive. I think they, they can be. Mm-hmm. It's not even I think they can be. I mean, you pick the best frames there. That, 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 that Trigon, I, I, I'm convinced that's going to be just as good as any Western brand. It's just when you can't get them. Like, so I'm on, again, just on Panda Podium. I mean, that's just, this is the easiest way to get a snapshot of what's available because he pulls them all in. Like, you've got your Yolio, he stocks. Windspace, he doesn't stock, but that's the obvi- other obvious one. There's... Titanium frames, which I'm not interested in. So of the carbon frames that don't do the direct to consumer, which there's only there's not that many of, at least that you can get in Australia. Mm. He's got Tavelo and the new Big Rock and a Voice Velo, but that's a that's a gravel frame set. So there's two road frame sets you can buy that aren't the established Elves wind space. So like, I mean, how there's like a gazillion over there. <laughs> I would love to be able to to shop around between ten different frame sets on Panda Podium, as an example. And I mean, it's theoretically they exist. 
It's just that's not there yet. Is it? Is it a potential conspiracy? Could could we could we delve into the into this as a big brand monopoly kill like stepping on the little guy <laughs> and making it more? I mean, we don't know. We don't know enough about the distribution of this this stuff. What's involved in it? Maybe they do make it difficult to to get the the products out. Well, um, you mean like so a Bross, for example, mm. which is on the backside of the cube stand at the expo. Mm. So, as in, are they maybe less likely? You mean potentially less likely to want to send out their own branded frames if they're also the OEM supplier for another brand. Yep. So they don't. They go well. Let's not. You know, let's not push the envelope and step on the toes of the other people using our factory. Yeah. You just, <laughs> I if, mean, even if you just think of the internal workings of some of these companies. Yeah, like maybe it's just not a fight they want to fight because well, it's, also, well, it's that, also a big exercise in just in in, in just the, the distribution and the marketing of it. Like to even, I'm not saying it's e- I'm, I'm not saying it's easy and that we should just these brands should just pop up and, and we expect to just be able to buy them and they ship them really cheap and easily. Like it's obviously a massive exercise, um, but it, you know it's 2024. <laughs> yeah. Well, hmm. can I roll that just quickly into a little chat about Trek? Trek, yes. yes. Trek bicycles. Trek. So this, yeah, just really briefly. So it sounds like Trek are downsizing a lot of their production um, due to financial bits and pieces that are going. I don't want to go too much into that, but they've come out and basically said that they want to reduce their overall bike models by 40% by 2026, 2027. So almost half of the bike models chopped out. Good thing or bad thing, Jesse? Bad. Hmm. Bad thing. The prices won't drop but and we're left with will. less choices to buy. <laughs> I mean, not to like, it is what it is. So I'm not saying this is, it's not like an us versus them thing. It's just, it's not good. No. I want to be able to select from 20 treks, not 10 or 12. It's just, yeah. But that is cheaper to do. But I just know that they're, they're going to pass. Well, actually, maybe they will. You know, you say, like, in the past, you would have said, there's no way they're going to pass that cost savings on. But maybe they will. Maybe. If the sales aren't high enough and, and, and they're getting undercut by other brands, maybe, maybe this just his take of the regular retail price over the last eight years just going up and then up again and then up again and then up again. Maybe. Uh, Did the price of the tarmac come down when, when Specialized got rid of the Venge? And went to one bike to do it all. No, I don't think. But it came are down, down with the SL. The it dropped by like a hundred. The top level SL8 dropped by like a hundred Australian dollars or two hundred Australian dollars, I think, when they went from SL7 to SL8. Okay, fair enough. Last year. Yeah. Oh, look. My my take on this was, and I really wasn't going to talk about it. Um, well, I was because obviously this is probably means the end of the Amanda or the. Madone, one of the two clearly gets chopped for we go one bike to do it all, which is sad. I, I 100% agree with you on that. And the other thing is uh, I haven't mentioned GCN for a while, but this, this one did bug me this week. Um, so they did a the one with Simon and um, – uh, God, I don't remember his name. Simon and um, Dan. Dan. So that's the main GCN show, the GCN show. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. And they kind of – is cycling too complicated? And the inference being, and they talked about Trek as well, the inference being that um, it's a good thing what Trek are doing because there's too many bike models and it's not like the old days when you could walk into a bike shop and there was a road bike, a mountain bike, and a cyclocross bike from Trek and that's all you had to choose from. Okay. So uh, now it's, it's got too confusing because there's too many models of bikes and people walk out of the bike shops going, Aero, what? Oh, you I do a climbing bike. I don't get it all. So mm-hmm. I didn't like the, the – I, I felt a little conspiracy theory about that one that they were being sort of helped to suggest that what Trek were doing was good mm-hmm. for, for, a, for the consumer okay. by reducing <laughs> – 
choice. It's definitely an opinion. I don't agree. I <laughs> couldn't disagree more. Right. Okay. In fact, I heartily disagree, which is why I wanted to <laughs> right. sort of just bring that up today. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, even come up, even ask themselves, would you be happier then with less choice? Because that's what we're ultimately going to end up with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What? I still, oh, God. Like the bike brands still live in this weird mix where are they making the bikes for the pros or for the consumers? And I think this is this year, the next couple of years, the, the brands are going to have to figure out who they're making bikes for because the, <laughs> where does this go? The, the, the pros need choice. They're performing at the extremes of climbing, the extremes of speed on flat roads. They need more choice. Uh, how does do, are the brands going to start to split? Do you, is it going to become Trek high performance, where they're just making bikes for the World Tour team and the pro teams that we potentially never get access to because they never bother to streamline that process for, from a mass production point of view and then there's just trek bicycle for us i feel like it's going to have to go that way because you can't if you, you you this idea of just making bikes for a consumer and a pro especially as the bikes get more going down the the marginal gains route for the pros which they Get, they get, they need that, and they still use the pros as their main marketing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 they're gonna have to. Something's gonna have to budge here. I don't under, I don't see how you can go more, condense your your um, product portfolio, blur the performance lines to make it more a, appealing to a broader range of punters, and then expect a pro to be happy to ride it. I, uh, yeah. Um, if you're about to comment, if you're about to comment, I, we see this every time we talk. And I just discreetly, okay. every time we talk about this, we see this comment. You guys are so out of touch because all you think about is elite race. No, no, no. What Jesse's talking about is true. Bike brands build bikes to try and win professional bike races. It's been like that for generations. And it is still the main way they market frames and bikes and brands. So if they are therefore giving the professionals, which are their main marketing, inferior bikes in, in comparison to their competitors, it's a problem. That's what we're talking about. Sorry. I just, but who's that a problem for? Well, it's a problem for that model that they've created. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if they were using, if, if the bike brand's marketing was the guy who finished in 10 hours, they followed some guy who did 10 hours at Peaks Challenge and that was their marketing, their main global marketing this year, then perfect. This, this new route is fantastic. But their main marketing is someone winning a sprint at 68 kilometers an hour. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, I mean, you're putting someone on an inferior product in comparison to someone on a fully-fledged aero mm -hmm. bike. See, that's, that's where I've almost contradicted myself because initially I said more choice is better. I still think that's true. Even if an aero bike's not suited to someone, some like, most people like the look of aero bikes. So right, I want to buy one anyway. So less choice for them is, is not good. But from a just, um, I guess, <laughs> in those margins of performance, it doesn't matter to the average, you know, the average rider. So actually reducing the models from a, from a performance point of view for the average rider doesn't matter. I still think if you're spending thirteen thousand US dollars on a bike, you should be able to pick you know, what, what you want it to look like and be like. Um, but but yeah, not from a performance point of view. But yeah, for for the pros, I mean, I don't know, I don't know where this goes in five years. I I don't see it ending with. I don't think it, I I can't see it staying as it is because you'll have teams like, uh, well. What um, you know, teams like probably you know probably Cervelo. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe what ends up happening is so ultimately what is what we're seeing are the big brands streamlining, aren't we? So the big brands that produce not the biggest though. I mean, giants okay, not streamlining. Well, that's, that's true. Some giant, of, giant, some of them. giant is at this yes, which is why we were 
ultimately positive with the TCR because <laughs> we're just happy it exists yeah. more than anything else. But, okay, Specialized in Trek, the biggest brands in the US have streamlines. Mm-hmm. Bad for their pro teams, potentially. M- maybe, maybe that's actually where the, the middle tier brand, because of its scale, is able to keep the three bottle, the three bike model, mm-hmm. and that's their that's their way of competing with the big brands mm-hmm. because they can they can do that with their with their scaling mm-hmm. and for their professional teams. So insert what are we? We could say we could say Cannondale, we could say Cervelo, we could say Orbea, we could say uh, Canyon potentially Ridley. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, these sort of ones are able to maintain the three bike model and reap the benefits. Yeah, of- I mean, there's benefits there. Yeah. it's not even. A, it's, not, it's not even. A, I mean, it's it's not every you know, on every stage in every race, but there's there's clearly a benefit. And I think that's how it. Sh- I mean, I think that's how it should go. I I don't see why in ten years. When there's only one, still one tarmac available, why the pros just have to, that are sponsored by Specialized just have to ride that. I mean, I'd love to see the Specialized high performance. Just go and produce a what, a frame that costs ten thousand US to produce, cost price, and and you know, and let them pros ride it. I mean, I don't I don't need to buy it. Well, mm. well, I'll buy the you know the SL ten. I don't care. I think that's that, I think I'd like to see that as a as a more defined path forward as opposed to this weird. Middle ground we're in now, we're not. It's not cut and dry. What, what's consumer? What's pro level? It's all mixed together. Do you think Trek dump the Madone or the Amonda? Well, they already have. I mean, they the Madone was the road. The Madone was the road bike. The Amonda was is relatively new. Back in the day, it was that's just true. the Madone. Yeah, that's true. That was that Lance Armstrong's. Race yep. bike was yeah, Madonna. Right. They brought in the Madonna. The Madonna. <laughs> Madonna. Imagine if they just Maybe changed the, the name. Madonna. The, the Madonna. <laughs> right. I reckon they go back to Madonna and they're just the Amon- the Amonda's yeah. done. You're probably right. Um, but yeah. But then mm. if you're on if you if mm. you're if you're you know if you're on track, you're going. Wait, where's my old, where's my aero? Can we bring back the aero bike from two years ago? And well, hold on, I got to climb the Galibier five times. Where's my where's my Amonda? Mm. Yeah. I mean. Uh, all right, a quick message from sports micro nutrition brand, Pillar Performance. Traditional nutrition products like hydration and carbohydrates will take you through to the finish line at Falls Creek, whereas Pillar's mission is to get you to the start line in the best condition over and over. In this episode, Pillar wants to bring awareness to the benefits that magnesium supplementation can have for you as a cyclist, particularly as it relates to sleep and recovery. So do you have trouble getting to sleep each night? Or do you suffer from reduced sleep quality, particularly after your biggest training days? If so, magnesium supplementation can help improve all areas of your sleep by regulating melatonin production and reducing cramps that interrupt sleep quality. Pillar's Triple Magnesium is a 300 milligram blend of absorbable forms of magnesium that tastes great and is informed sport batch tested to be free from banned ingredients. If you would like to try Pillar today, get 15% off by using code Nero at pillarperformance.shop. Or for North American listeners, head to thefeed.com slash pillar and enter code Nero for 15% off. So I did it. Fondo boy. There were doubters. Jesse Coyle sat over there and he said, what the hell are you doing, Miller? Uh, well, I did it. Peaks you challenge. pulled that one out of your <laughs> rear end. I pulled that one well out done. of two sugar flasks That's is proper, what I pulled it out of. Um, proper slog. Yeah, quick. Quick, should I just quickly mention? So it's a yep. 235 kilometer, four and a half thousand meter day in the Australian Alps. We do call them Alps. They're they're big enough climbs. Um so I just wanted to have a quick chat about some of the chat I had down there, some of the stuff I saw, yep. how my sort of stuff went. Where should I start? Can I start with Maybe just some bikes and bits and pieces that I saw. Yeah, yep. All right. Mm-hmm. So having a snoop around having as usual. Having a sniff, having a sniff around. Um, I do, yeah, I will say this. I, I, it does surprise me every time I leave Sydney or my little Sydney bubble mm-hmm. just how popular specialised bikes are. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. are, it's not like a dominant, dominant force, but it's clearly the most popular bike. Yep. And they've still from what i saw in this particular event 
you know, their SL7s, didn't see too many SL8s, one mm-hmm. or two, but that SL6 rim brake, easily the most popular rim brake bike I saw. Um, yep. And that is, that is just a person who, this is their event. Like it's hard to, to stress in this part of the world, like how important that event is for a lot of people because it's, it's obviously a really challenging day, but it's, it's a goal someone will set mm-hmm. for like six months. Oh, it's long. I get people that will contact me for coaching and that, it'll be two years out. I, mm. I want to do peaks 2026, but I would, that's not, that wouldn't be rare. That's fairly common. It's and like a two year process. That generation of rim brake. And I'm not, I'm not, I will ultimately sit here and say my disc brake bike was su- superb, but that generation of the rim brake bike is fantastic for that event. Mm-hmm. That, yeah. What are we talking? 2018, 17, mm-hmm. that sort of bike. And mm-hmm. yeah, that, that SL7, uh, FL6, super, super popular. Um, there was, of course, the, the people that just have a genuine problem and they admit their problem, which is the, the weight, the weight weenie, the, the, the stereotypical weight weenie is sort of over 50 and has built a sub five and a half kilo bike. Uh, Shout to Blair, one of the guys. He had okay. a an R5 Ooh. with lightweight um, yep. AX lightness, everything. I've got some footage of it. I'll, I'll chuck it up while I'm talking. It was 5.32 mm. um, tubs, 23 mil tubs on there. The only the, – it, it's interesting. I mean, you're climbing you're, and descending. Is comfort coming into play here? I mean, I know that bike, maybe if you were riding that in the 2017 edition of Peaks Challenge, you you are – the big dog on the start line with your decked out weight weenie bike. But that's before people really <laughs> knew what a comfortable bike was. I mean, that's a long, long 10 hour day. I mean, I know you get out of the saddle, it'll feel good, but geez. That bike is inferior to my bike. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, but yeah, he, he, this is, this yeah. is why I, I framed this whole like, uh, category of people and they admit it, mm-hmm. they have a problem. Mm-hmm. Like every single bolt on these bikes is thought about for, from a weight perspective. Mm-hmm. They don't care what it rides like. They want to know, they want it to go on the scales and say something with a five. Um, he, I mean, this particular guy, he won't ride with spares. He's running tubs. <laughs> He's, it's all in for, for, for what happens on that particular day. I mean, okay. like you said, there's, the descending is almost just as important as the ascending on this particular event. And uh, to descend on that thing with 3,000 people around you would have been absolutely terrifying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Sorry, Blair. I'm just fucking up. dumped on oh, your no, setup. It, but, that's, but it's funny because that's the chat I had with <laughs> okay, him. Okay, you had it yeah, in person. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, yeah. 100% Gave had the him chat some, with him. Okay, good. He was full anti-disc brakes. Okay. All good. <laughs> all good. Um, right. The other thing, SRAM just has absolutely taken that yes. new generation. It's, it's <laughs> unbelievable. I don't unbelievable. even like SRAM. I'm just cheering for it's, them. Yeah. That SRAM force group set, easily. The most popular <laughs> thing going around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's 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 a generation. It's a yeah. It's a generational thing. Mm-hmm. It, it clearly is that late twenties, early thirties. Maybe got into it around COVID. That that type of of rider mm-hmm. on a Focus or a BMC or Cannondale or something. They're they're on a a a, sh- a SRAM bike, almost like the SRAM rival or something. Now is what one hundred and five was for us okay that's in yeah yeah i mean that what you just said makes a lot of sense to me I, most people listening probably what are you, what, what are you talking about you like shimano 105 was an institution institution it was it was oh it's it was so important shimano 105 so okay so now it's like oh you got the shram rival yep yep okay like that's a big deal but that's so, to get that level of um like spread across the market where you're noticing at an event, you have to sell so many group sets to do that. That's is SRAM a publicly traded company? I don't think it is. No, it's privately. I wonder I'd love to see the stock price if that was publicly traded of SRAM over the last five years. And it's weird how the conversation sort of changes 
because if I see, had seen someone with a SRAM bike, I would probably wouldn't have spoken to them or made anything. When I saw a, a Shimano group set, I almost was – tempted to ask that person, oh, why did you choose Shimano? <laughs> yeah, because it, it kind of felt like that was the, oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I, I am aware SRAM in mountain bike is really big. Mm. I'm, so don't, like, I understand, like, Shra- the, the performance of SRAM as a corporation isn't all reliant on then selling road group sets. I am aware. I'm just saying I don't care how many mountain bike group sets they sell. I'm just putting that out. A couple of little uh, other ones that I found interesting. A few people coming up talking about tubeless, but thinking they were talking about hookless. So asking me along the lines of, oh, have you had any problems with your tubeless? Have you had any explosions? And sort of going, oh, they haven't had any problems with tubeless. None of their mates have. They think it's overblown. Our chat about it all. Right. And it wasn't until I was like, oh, you mean hookless? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fuck, and there's on a, big a few times, yeah, there is. And and it, it, there was. And that, oh, no. that actually happened three times. Wow. I had okay. that conversation with people. Um, I mean, the words do sound similar. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And yeah. If, if you're coming to a tubeless setup for the first, and this was, this was the case, if you're coming to a tubeless setup for the first time, that was actually one of the conversations, was, was like, oh, I'm, I'm not sure about going to tubeless because of, because of all these explosions that are happening. And the inference being there that like either all tubeless is hookless or just completely mixing it up. Right. Yeah. Oh. So that's, I don't know whether that's a job that the bike industry, certainly uh, hooked rim people need to be pushing to really advertise the fact you are running. Or all tubeless. What did tubeless ever do to anyone? Yeah, really. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Um, So, but that thing, but having said that, the cut through of lower tire pressures does seem to be making, and, and it, it is important to say, like the 3,000 people, three and a bit thousand people doing this, they're not just riding once or twice a month. Like if no, you're, no, no, no. There's, yeah. there's no other versions of this event. You know, sometimes you go to the 80, the, the 120, mm-hmm. like if you're turning up to do this, you're turning up to spend a minimum of eight hours on the bike. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The last little equipment thing I'll say is I felt like the, the tricking your bike out is back. So by that, I mean, you have your, essentially what I did, um, you have your deep section wheels at home, but for this particular event, you put the, the lightweight rims on. So mm-hmm. you put your 30 mils and that kind of stuff. And this is where the Panda Podiums, the director consumer Chinese brands have massively cut in mm. because for them, what's that brand? The C, CRW Works. The two guys asked me about those, just those 1,200 gram, 1,100 gram, you know, 30 mil deep wheels, slap them on, save 300 grams over your normal setup, happy days. You've got them for your, for your hilly fondos. Mm-hmm. And most of them all are really good with their internal rim widths and they're pretty much all hooked, mm-hmm. most of those ones. Yep. So that seems to be back. It's like the, it's like the race wheels thing that we were used to is mm-hmm. now you have your shallower yeah. section rim okay. for this particular event. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Cause yeah, we, we, we did get sold the, you know, every bike's just going to come stock with 40 mil deep wheels and, and that's all you're going to ride. Uh, which, you know, it's, that, that is true, but yeah, for, for an event like this, cool. pull out your little, your little trinkets. Now, do you have to run compulsory lights? Yes. That's right. So the- there's some, there's always some good light. There's some just, I feel like it's the computer nerds that then they get into cycling and they've got these amazing light setups and they're like all minimalist and custom like bonded on and there's some, there's some good tricked out uh, light setup. There's those and then there's the classic where people cut up the Fondo number. You know how it's got like little transponder in it. They cut it up and put it, attach it to like a piece of cardboard and then in, make that as part of their race number holder mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. So there's that. Yeah. I mean, I will make a video of this because I, I did get some really good footage of it. And um, I ran that little, can I just quickly mention, I mentioned that ran that little Insta360 Go thing on my chest. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think it's actually the perfect bike computer. Yeah, so the battery doesn't last for. Yeah, but you don't need it. Like who wants okay. to sit and watch two hours of riding around? You just, you're there with, with it here mm. on your chest and you can just go beep, beep. Okay. Film two minutes and beep, beep, turn it off. 
Easy. Happy days. Okay. So, yeah, had a good day. We'll ultimately try and get, get something up on the channel about it. But how do you feel, Jesse Coyle, mm -hmm. about receiving outside help for completing a Fondo? Outside help. Yes. Let me, let me explain the situation. So uh, as part of there's um, as part of this particular event, it's been running for years. It's, it's your time is, there's a, your time is kind of your time type thing. And there's, there's different, you know, sub eight, sub nine, sub 10, you've got to finish it within 13 hours and this sort of stuff. But Mark O'Brien was chasing the course record or the event record, I should say, to try and go sub seven hours. And unfortunately, what happened is he uh, used outside people to pace him at certain points of the event um, because the, the way something like this would work is he's a multitude better than pretty much anyone else doing the event. So he got to the base of the second climb and a few boys popped out of the out of the out of the shrubs, <laughs> literally, and uh, paced him up the climb, and then wow. popped okay. out of the the next. Uh, there's there's a big gap of about a hundred k's between the top of the first climb and the bottom of the second climb or the third climb, sorry, and paced him down to that. Uh, he, he was really overt about this, so was telling everyone before the event that it was going to happen. Uh, he did make mention on the start line when he was asked about it, he said, oh, actually, all the guys had pulled out, so he was going to have to do it solo. Right. So I remember he said that, and I thought, oh, maybe someone said something to him. Um, but then when he uh, essentially attacked at the first climb, he took a couple of guys that were doing the event with him, mm -hmm. and uh, then they, yeah, they then told us, because it actually worked out for us in the sense because – when Mark had all these other guys jumping in, he was sort of exploding all the poor blokes that were up there with him. And we were the second group on the road and mm -hmm. they were coming back to us and informing us of what the right. hell was going on. All right. Now, I don't know whether he was given nutrition well, by Well, that, so that was my next question. Is there, is there, was there feeding happening here? Um, I would read. I would read between the lines probably. and say probably. Maybe a bottle? If, okay. Certainly if, if that had happened. Um, okay. Before I let you go, because I want to talk about this obviously so the as judge, well. Judge, judy, mm. jury, and executioner. There, this is so. Th this is an event where there is a, a a declared winner. So, not that it would have ever been in doubt. He's like gen stratospherically better than everyone else. Yep. But you are dedicated the winner, and I'm not sure if there's a cash prize on that. But there is a cash prize on the KOMs, which again he would have won anyway. But there you go. Okay. Um, so what do you reckon? Outside help for a fondo. Okay. There's a lot. There's a lot of angles. My my initial my initial thing is that it's just a fondo and I don't care. <laughs> so that was my. But then I actually started thinking about it. Going, okay, hold on. There's 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 some there's some caveats. Here. There's some potential kind of issues here. Firstly. Um, so what I'm thinking of, what, what is this like? To me, this is kind of like the, the Kipchoge sub two hour, the marathon thing where you've, he's done a sub two hour marathon, but because it's not in a recognized way as part of an event, it's, it doesn't count as a world record. To me, this is the same bucket. So is this a course record? In my opinion, no, because to get the course record, it has to be done as part of the event firstly. and you should only be getting drafting off people that are also happen to be doing the event, which is, which is not the case. Uh, so I, I'd probably say, you know, because this is something you could just do on any other day, like head out with some mates. We're just going to chop off the, on the peaks course and see if we can do a sub seven. So why does it need to be done as part of the course? It's, you know, to me, it's still not a course record because the people you were doing it with weren't, or why didn't they start with him? People that pay. So maybe that, um, um, well, I just, part of me doesn't really mind because it's a grand final. It's not a race anyway, but then I'm kind of thinking what the problem with the outside help thing, especially if it involves feeding too, because we've run into this before we, when we did snowy classic a couple of years ago, we were coming into, into Jindabyne on some of the rollers and guys are getting bottles from, from the wife and kids on the side of the road. And I'm kind of going, well, 
Like, you've, the, the, I mean, the whole difference between a Grand Fondo and a road race in particular, there's a few differences. One of the main things is that your Grand Fondo is self-supported. It's self-paced. All you have is the feed zones to stop and use the sub- things as supplied by the event. Road race has feed zones. There's outside help. There's sometimes team cars and things like that. So if you're, I don't like the, 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 the I think it should be a hard and fast rule, no outside help from a Grand Fondo because mainly not, because I have a problem with the record in particular, really. It's more that what does that mean for the guy that's doing it in 10 hours? That's my- if, you're, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're doing it in 10 and you're halfway up the climb and you're going, oh, it's all good. A couple guys with me, we're all going to have to stop at the top of the climb together anyway because everyone needs to fill up the bottles and then we can pace on the, on, on the flat sections. But you know, if some guy's just got his mates handing him bottles up the climb, and he carries on. It ruins. It's just a whole terrible precedent that sounds like it's a nothing burger. But actually, if you're doing the event, and this is probably the prem, this is the premier Grand Fondo in Australia. Like that makes that makes a difference to the other people that are racing. Like it it'd piss it piss me off. This stops now. The, okay. This precedent cannot be set. Um, yeah, you you. I'm glad you went there because that's a hundred percent what was angering me the most about this. Uh, I don't give a shit about the course record. Doesn't mean anything to me. The Melbourne bubble can get all excited about that. What I don't like is the people who are struggling to finish this event, struggling to even to get to the cutoff points in time so they don't get time cut out of it, being told that the guy who did it in half their time received assistance that they didn't get. And then they go away and think, yeah, okay, well, mm. what I'll do next year <laughs> yeah. is I'll get, I'll get my <laughs> wife to wait here and then, then where does it stop? Then, then you've got a car in front of you. What between Hotham and 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 Falls Creek? Why not? I mean, it's good. I might as well get a car in front of me if I've got a couple of blokes waiting for me. I look. I just want to quickly. Oh. No, no. Let me finish. Ah, oh, okay. All, all right. right. Uh, no, let me finish. Right. So this stops now, and some of it is on all the people who who run fondos in this country. No, I have experienced this before when I did. Climb to Chrysler in the US. I got a little shirty at it because the first line on the entry form was no outside help. I wanted to make a video of it and I wanted Elizabeth to sort of follow me in the car and we was gonna we were gonna shoot some footage and they were absolutely adamant that was not allowed to happen because this was going to potentially impact the, the time, my time, and you could only use their preordained Feed stops. You couldn't even go to a gas station. You mm-hmm. have to use their feed zones because their time was so important and have to be kept precious and all this sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I see why now mm. because this completely alters the ethos of of what a fondo is. It's it's about finding the group that you're in, motivating them, like playing. That's that's almost the tactics of the fondo is work with these guys who may be a little stronger with than you just to get them going, do enough. I mean, that's the dynamic that makes it so entertaining. This has to stop now. I just don't understand. Well, so is this not in the rules? Because I'm thinking, well, like, Marco's been around for, for, eight, for forever. He know he would, like, I'm sure he's not, it mustn't have been in the rules. I'm sure he wouldn't have broken the rules if, if it said you can't. So was this just not a, is it not a, it, it's just never something they hadn't thought of, that they didn't need to stipulate that you, you can't, Get outside help. I, what's, I've heard alternate opinion. Right. No, it's not a, not in the rules. So okay. th- there's that. So it hasn't broken any rules. No, so, but by a from by, what from I a, understand, from no. Okay. Now, um, no, from what I understand, no. So that's why I'm saying it stops now. I don't. Again, I don't care about the record this time around, but it has to stop now. He probably just didn't think anything of it. Like I don't think he's been malicious with it. I it, mean, he's probably just gone. Oh, I want to do a really. I want to see if I can break the record. Hey, guys, can you pace me and hand me a bottle? On but he, the but so I just, but, but it's just, it's just such a dumb thing. Like it's all such. You should just do it on another day, and it should just be in the rules of the event that you, if you're doing a grand fondo, you, you do it on your own. I, I mean, it's just not. I do think a lot. Of, even unfortunately, here. I do think a bit of this is maybe on bicycle networks management. Maybe they just hadn't experienced it because he was overtly obvious that he was going to do this. Right. And I don't know. I don't know Mark at all, but it felt like he just needed a tap on the shoulder and say. Well, if you want the course record, you can't do it with guys helping you. Yeah. 
It seems um, pretty. It seems, seems quite obvious. Seems quite obvious, but at this point, I think it just needs to be. Mm. It needs to be written down. Mm. Um, I'd be really interested. I'm really interested in the comments on this. I feel like most people in the US will go, "Yeah, of course. Like, clearly, you don't need outside help." But then there's this weird thing. But in the UK, they have sportifs, and I and they're very different. They right. are far more. You're on fully open roads. You're. You probably you could even be starting with the club ride that then changes into the Fondo thing and, mm-hmm. yeah, so. You know, the, the, the sad thing about this for me is that, like, it, it's, it's actually a pretty cool story mm. of him actually doing it. And he's got, he, is he, I don't he's got, he's not on a team. I don't know if he's got sponsors or something, but I'm kind of thinking, would it, <laughs> I, I, because we make YouTube videos, I'm sitting here going, why didn't you just do that on another week? Get who I don't know. I'm guessing he's got he's he, he bloody won Melbourne to Warrnambool Bull and he's you know he's been around. He's sure he's got sponsors. Like, wouldn't that be a cool video? Breaking the three piece record. So, so like I don't know if this is a conspiracy theory, but I messaged Bicycle Network and said, um, "You should make a video of this." Yeah. When I heard about this record thing, thinking like because what you could you could you know breaking the record. You put that up on YouTube and you could try and um, you could try and trigger. All these, you know, American, UK, German weapons to be like stuff that I'm, I'm better than this Marco guy, yeah. and you could potentially have this amazing wave of like forty elite internationals coming down next year because they'd heard, they'd seen this crazy video of this guy breaking this record, mm-hmm. and basically on that were like, no, Mark doesn't want anyone filming it. I was like, oh, oh, okay, okay, right, interesting. Anyway. I just that would be a cool approach of like okay, whether it's in the rules or not. Well, who cares? Make something of it. Mm. Right now, it's just a little. I mean, you've got his Strava of it and the finish line photo and the time on the sheet. There's nothing. There's no trace of it anywhere else besides that, and which is kind of a wasted opportunity, in my opinion. Well, we're filming this on what the thirteenth of March. The weather looks good this weekend, Mark. Just go out and <laughs> chop off and smash yep. it again, and we can get a video edit and retract it, it together. and move on. Because I think, uh, but yeah, like ultimately for me, every every fondo in this country now, you just need to have that in the conditions of entry. No outside help. Full mm. stop. Yeah. Which you know, thought was obvious. It's a fucking grand fondo. <laughs> you can't get yeah. Anyway, it's a grand fondo, but it's where the time matters so much to people. You know, there are guys that have been trying to go sub eight. I was talking to someone in the Centennial Park who's done it 11 times and he's been trying to go sub eight forever. And he's mm-hmm. been like five minutes out, 11 minutes out. And well, if he could have got a little <laughs> in the back, he mm-hmm. might have got there. Mm-hmm. Can I finish up with just a bit of uh, bling? Well, yeah, I think it's bling, recovery bling. Mm-hmm. I, I, put my, I put my legs for the first time ever into some Novatech boots. On Sunday, Saturday afternoon, prior to the, the big lap. Oh, I like a set. <sighs> you know what? I've never heard anyone that's used Norma Tech recovery boots say they don't like them. Is, it, it is, for me, 100% hit rate. Once someone uses them, they want them. Is there any scientific research? Is there any study that shows any benefit at all? They say yes. I haven't, I don't know, I, I couldn't, I would be, it's not something that you'd really research, like. Compression. Oh. It's essentially right. compression, right? But it's different, it's, that's not, you would, it's not the typical compression that would be used in research. Mm. I don't know, I haven't looked into it, so I couldn't really answer that. It doesn't really matter, I mean, it makes your legs feel good. It just, yeah, I mean. <laughs> so, it, what, do you don't need research for that? I mean, go get a, like, you get a massage, I mean. But it's, I actually yeah. think it's even better than that. Because so what's it doing? Well, it's, Explain. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's compression. So it's, it's blowing, it's filling up of these enormous socks that go up to your crutch with air, mm-hmm. um, compressing it, letting it go, compressing it, letting it go. So just uh, like, yeah, basically How long like, is a, the, uh, like a python kind of squeezing your legs. So it was a 30-minute session. 30 minute. Okay. Sat there with my legs up on the couch, blowing, blowing air in. It was quite quiet. I was actually answering YouTube comments as I sat there and oh, wow. got got aroused by the whole thing. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's it's like a full leg massage up to sort of back of your 
back of your butt, basically. That's why they get – so the price is why they, they – it's, it's, a, it's a laughed at product in some circles because they're 1500 bucks. Um, Australian dollars. I mean, it's a lot of money. So, like, I mean, if you're kind of going, is that worth? I mean, I mean, there's a go- there's a golden question: Is it, are they are they worth fifteen hundred bucks? It's fifteen massages, probably. Yeah, I reckon. Uh, if you yeah if, yeah if you break it down that way, yeah. I mean, you know, I I. I would I pay fifth? So would I pay fifteen hundred bucks for a pair? Probably not. Would I like a pair? Yeah. Do I think they're going to raise your FTP by fifteen watts? No. Would it help you get through a fifteen-hour training week? Yeah, I would. I, I'd say probably would. Um, but they're fifteen hundred bucks, <laughs> so. <laughs> So what would you, yeah, would you buy a pair? Yes. You would? Yeah, I think I would. So you would or you are? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that's a negotiation I'll probably have to have with Elizabeth at some okay. point. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, uh, I don't know. I kind of think about it. Massages, sauna. No, 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 no. Takes, mm, sauna's no. way better. Sauna's, yeah. that's, that's, well, okay, so sauna is just way better? It's very different, but sauna is a, if you use properly, is a, is a physiological enhancement. You can't really, it's like saying Normatec boots or 2 by 20 at FTP. Like it's, 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 a, it's an intervention. So I wouldn't even put. Oh, well, then that the answer there. probably then is no. Okay. Because I, I would, you know, I'd set aside a certain amount of money for, what I would regard as like extracurricular recovery things. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think if sauna is just trumping everything, then I don't have one at home. There's no way I could ever have one at home. So it would be going up to the local sort of right. place. Okay. And that's costing that sort of money mm-hmm. probably mm-hmm. for a year. So mm-hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. That said, they were very nice. Mm. They were very cool. Especially like, at an event, stay before Rico and then slap them on. I'm trying to think of other things in my, that in my sphere are in this Normatech bucket. Like what else would I potentially spend 1500 bucks on? Um, you know, to me, I'd even put some supplements in this group. It's like, will I spend $200 on a series of nitrate? beetroot shots and load them before a race. And that it's sort of in that arena. Um, so that's probably something I'd toss in, which is kind of a nice to have. Um, for me, like do, a, a sauna isn't a nice to have. It's a necessity depending on what the race is. Um, trying to think of anything else. But that's, so, because yeah, there's one in, but that's because there's one in your building. No, I bought one. Oh, sorry. Oh, before I had a nice professional one, I was sitting in that stinky tent. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, I've, I've, I've gone through... I've, you know, I've done the hard yards. Now I can sit in a nice wood professional sauna, yeah. but that wasn't always yeah. the case. Yeah, true. Um, yeah, all those auxiliary supplements do sort of fit into that bill, like beta aladrine, even the pillar stuff. Like that's all kind of in that world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's a matter of what, what yeah. Well, the, be- what, the best, this particular guy lacking? whose boots I was using, he just has everything. Just, oh, he's just, okay. just lined it up. But he doesn't, if it's, if there's a, Perceived percent, yeah, he's he's got it. Um, the Theragun, all those. Uh, see, I wouldn't count that in this sort of space because a professional massage is just vastly. Superior. I find it so funny, like not funny, but it's just how, how different it is. Floating. Oh, That's another float one. Tank. Float yeah. tank. Yeah, yeah. He does the float tank. Oh my god. Yeah. So I gets a float on. I think people would probably cry if they saw how the, the, the little intervention, even in my like training blocks, I, I don't use anything. It's like all I do is sleep nine hours a night. And like, I know it's like kind of a meme to say, but I, 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 and I do, I have a massage gun. I don't get mass. I, when I was, you know, my, I don't really get massages, do a bit of self massage. 
Taj Gun. What would you call it? I don't, next taste? No, no, no. Like as a, you know, I know it sounds weird, but I do. Um, I don't use any. And then you've got like the guy that's just got is this everything. Mm. <laughs> like, All right, Jesse, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for listening to me. Uh, for everyone else, do remember to check out pillarperformance.shop, the feed.com slash pillar for the pillar discount using Nero at checkout. We will see you all next week.